Welcome back. At this point, we've uh, completed our derivation of the finite element method for uh, 1D linear elliptic PDEs. And uh, we've also spent a little time in understanding the basic mathematical properties of the finite element method, uh, and uh, especially with application to this problem, uh, as well as how that pans out into uh, studies of the consistency and convergence of the method, and therefore, uh, to error analysis, really, right? We looked at how the, the error of the finite element solution, the, the error in the finite element solution, converges with um, element size tending to zero. <clears throat> what I'd like to do in um, this segment, and maybe the next one or two, is uh, look at an um, alternate way in which the weak form can be obtained. And uh, this approach is um, a, uh, a subset of um, a type of calculus that may be sometimes called variational calculus or more broadly, uh, variational methods. Okay, so uh, the topic of this segment is uh, going to be, um, we're, we're working towards variational methods. Uh, so, uh, so let me start out with uh, talking about Uh, variational methods, okay? Before we can get there, however, we, of course, have to motivate it, right? And uh, in order to motivate it, um, let us consider the following, all right? Uh, consider the following integral. Consider, um, let me call this um, I uh, I depending on U, okay, written in this form. And um, I'm going to write it as, I'm going to define it here. It is the integral over uh, the domain of the following quantity, one half E A U comma X, the whole square DX. All right, now uh, when you stare at this integral, if you uh, remind yourself of uh, one-dimensional linearized elasticity, you will recognize E to be the modulus, right? And you will recognize U comma X, right? That quantity to be the strain, okay? And then, when you stare at this integral, you would recognize it to be the the strain energy, right? The strain energy in uh, linearized elasticity. The strain energy in linearized elasticity, of course, in 1D. Right? Um, so, so this is all uh, well and good. Now, what one can do is, is the following. So we, we, we make this recognition first, and then um, the, you know, one, once we recognize that there is this notion of a strain energy, we can ask ourselves, well, what does it do for elasticity problems, right? Um, of course, it gives us a notion of, of, the, of the energy stored in the elasticity problem, uh, but it also allows us to construct a uh, different kind of quantity, okay? Um, it allows us to construct a 
the following integral. Okay. Um, now, I'm, now I'm going to start putting down the kind of notation that we need for the development ahead of us, right? Uh, it allows us to cons consider the following in, uh, integral or to construct the following integral, which I'm going to denote uh, as pi. It also depends upon u, right? Um, and in the context of elasticity, this is the, well, this is just the displacement field, right? U is the displacement field. And pi of u, I'm now going to define uh, by a few terms, by using a few terms. The first is going to be the same uh, term that we wrote up above, the integral we wrote above, the uh, strain energy. Okay. Now, uh, recalling the, the other data of the strong form of the problem. Right? I'm going to add on a few more integrals. I'm going to add on integral over omega F, which you recall is our distributed forcing, right? Times U multiplied by A for the area dx minus, um, I am also going to consider the traction that we apply in the context of a Dirichlet Neumann problem, okay? Um, so TA would be the force, right? The, that, that makes up the traction. That multiplied by U at the position L, okay? So I want us to consider this. And um, consider this integral uh, where uh, we are saying, as we did for the strong form of the problem, that U belongs to the space S, right? Uh, our usual uh, space of functions for the, um, for the exact solution, right? The, the space is function of functions from, from which we draw the exact solution, right? So U belongs to S, uh, which now consists of uh, all functions uh, U such that uh, we're thinking, we're thinking of this in the context of our Dirichlet Neumann problem, right? So we're thinking of this in the context uh, of the Dirichlet condition, u at zero equals uh, u naught, okay? All right, um, and uh, f, t, and uh, the constitutive relation that we are familiar with sigma equals e u comma x, right? All of these are given. Right? Consider the following, uh, consider this setting. Now, um, what I want you to do is, con uh, is uh, focus your attention upon this integral that I've defined, that I've written as pi, and uh, ask yourself what it is, right? What does it tell us physically, at least for this problem, if we're thinking of an elasticity problem? Right, take a few seconds to look at it. Uh, note that the first term is the strain energy. Uh, this term, I'll point out to you, the, um, gives you the total work done by the force F on the displacement. And this, recognizing that TA is also a force, is the work done by the traction specified for the Neumann boundary condition on the displacement at that end. So in the context of elasticity, if you've studied that problem, this is something that you probably recognize as a potential energy, right? More broadly, more broadly, pi is um, pi of u is something that we actually can call the Gibbs free energy, okay? 
when we restrict our attention to uh, mechanics only, right? The Gibbs free en energy for uh, purely mechanical systems. Or purely mechanical problems. All right. Um, also called, like I said earlier, uh, the potential energy in the context of uh, mechanics. It turns out, as many of you may know, that the Gibbs free energy is actually applicable to uh, uh, general uh, processes in physics. It's typical to have a contribution from chemistry, maybe from, from, from uh, temperature and so on, also in the Gibbs free energy. However, if we restrict ourselves to only mechanical problems, as we're trying to, as we're doing in this case, then pi of u would be recognized to be the Gibbs free energy restricted to that. Okay. Um, all right, so that, that, that's something to note. Now, I want you to also observe that as a matter of notation, I've written uh, u in rectangular brackets there, right? Um, what I'm trying to point out here is that there is a, the, the, the reason I'm writing u in, um, in rectangular brackets is that I want you to think of this quantity pi as not just a function, okay? So I'm going to state that here. Pi of u is not a function. Okay. The reason it's not a function is because a function, properly defined, mathematically defined, takes on a um, point value of its argument and returns to us another point value. Okay. Uh, or more typically, uh, a, a function is a mapping from, um, typically from real numbers into real numbers. Okay. So, so. Let, let me just, just, just state this. So, um, so supposing we do indeed have a function g of x, okay? This may typically be uh, a mapping from the space of real numbers, right, from which you may take x onto real numbers, right? And graphically, this can be represented as follows. So on this axis, I have x, I have g. And in order to get a particular value of g, you would go on to the horizontal axis, choose a particular value of x, and say, all right, what is the value of g? Maybe it is that one. Uh, you take another value of x, you pick your value of g, that's that, right? Maybe this is this, and the process goes on, right? Now, the function that we have in mind is what we get by connecting all of these dots. Right, and maybe it does something else out here, okay? Nevertheless, the important idea is that when we take a particular value of x, right? We get back a, well, actually what I've drawn is, um, it's, okay, it's okay. We get back a particular value of g. All right? Okay, so in this sense, a function takes a point value of its argument and returns a point value, or it takes, in this case, a real number and, and returns a real number. Pi, however, is a little different. Okay? And I want you to think for a few seconds or maybe a little longer. Uh, in what manner pi, as defined on the previous slide, is different? Is it in, in what manner is pi different from this function g that I've specified here? Right? So, how is pi of u different?
you know the answer immediately if you've gone through this sort of exercise and um, you may still know the answer, you may figure it out. But the response is that um, in order to evaluate pi, we need more than just a point value of u. Because pi is an integral, we actually need the entire field u in order to evaluate pi. And then, in fact, when we supply the entire field u defined on our domain omega, we get back a real number for pi. Okay? So, let me state that here. Pi of u is a mapping of a field, right? A field u, which is a u is properly a function of x, right? Because you, you, you pick a particular value on your domain x and you get a particular value for the displacement, right? You get back a point value for the displacement, right? You get back a real number for the displacement, right? So that's the nature of u. u is a function. However, pi is a mapping of that entire field u, okay, uh, to um, the real numbers. Right? And why to real numbers? Because we have recognized pi to be an energy of sorts. It's a free energy or a potential energy, which after all is a scalar, right? It's a number, right? It gives us a real number. Mathematically stated, we have the following. Pi of u is a mapping from something that tells us where we draw u from. Where do we draw u from? Right, we draw it from our function space S, okay? So pi is a mapping from S to the real numbers, okay? 